I wanted to ask you about, of course, uh, a uh, another of your your many exposés that uh, received international attention, Abu Ghraib. Can you talk about how you got onto Abu Ghraib and the impact that that story had, and not only in the United States, but across the Muslim world? There was nothing that I wrote, wrote that wasn't known and been reported by Human Rights Watch. A wonderful guy named John Sifton it was just brilliant. Uh, Amnesty International were writing, doing reports, talking about torture. It's the same thing that, that I was reading in the 60s about Vietnam, it, that it, by church groups are writing books about it that didn't make the media. And they were doing torture. And I couldn't find a—and in the fall of— uh, uh, 2003, in December, what happened is we won the war, we thought, quickly, and it turned out we didn't win. What, what uh, uh, Don Rumsfeld, that man, called dead-enders, once we thought the war in two months, the, what he called the dead-enders turned out to be the guys ready, ready, the Ba'ath Party people we thought we'd gotten rid of, and we were in a civil war, and we were being chopped to death. In that December, I was in—I went to Damascus, and there was a two-star general. We grabbed most of the generals. Most of the generals who served in the Iraqi army, we grabbed. We either killed them or we turned them around and put them in the units that became killer units, or we used them for intelligence. This guy was missed. He was a, um, he was a, um, a linguist, a two-star. And I got him to Damascus. He, I think it cost 700 bucks for him to take a car. You could do it then. It was safe. There was a, a period it was still then. He took a car from, Damas uh, from um, Baghdad to Damascus. He had, he had a daughter in med school, and he had to stay there because she didn't know English, and she wanted there was, the medical school was in Arabic, and she could do it. I don't know what happened to him. And I spent four days with this two-star general who was in signals intelligence and knew everything. And I'm debriefing him, right? I, I don't take, put anything in the computer. And about the third or fourth day, he said, and let me tell you about that prison of a grave, which I'd read stuff about. He said, um, my friend's wives and daughters are writing and saying, you must come and kill me, because I've been defiled. You know, in, in that part of the world, they deal in shame. We deal in guilt here, in this, this part of guilt and denial here. But they dealt in shame. And they said, they've been defiled. The GIs have done things to them. I'm not sure to what extent. And you've got to come and kill me, because I'm no longer fit. I can't be your wife, and I can't, I can't be your wife, and I can't be, your, I can't be married. And so, what's going on? So I got into it. I mean, that, I, was, I knew then maybe I could find a way. And then I heard about photographs. And then I heard that CBS had some photographs. There had been a report written, a secret report. And um, um, once I got that, I got it. I got the report written by a brilliant officer named Antonio Tagubo who was fired over it because Rumsfeld thought Taguba had to give it to me. How, how dumb is that? I didn't see him. I didn't know him for two years. I'm, I'm his dear friend. I have lunch with him all. He's the most wonderful man. I go in a foxhole with him. And uh, there are these people. The general. He just wrote a two-star report that wrote, he was ready for a third. He was, he was a Filipino. He got out of college uh, uh, weighing uh, uh, five foot three, weighing 115 pounds, and three times he asked the Army, as he was in a career, a military career, to, for, to help pay for graduate school. And they said to him, you don't even speak English well. You know, you're just some little yellow guy. We have I'm, a minute and a half. So what happened is, I got the report, and it was devastating. And it was all because he had told me how bad it was. And the New York Times published it. And um, uh, CBS had the, same, had the same photographs I had, and it had refused two for two or three weeks to publish them. It was just a terrible story. And these are the just, photographs of torture of prisoners right. at Abu They had had it for two weeks. And they didn't run it. Well, and, but, you know, the, the people in, in doing it, the reporters, Dan Rather and Mary Mapes, the producers, wanted to, but the suit stopped them. And so I actually worked out a deal where they published it 60 minutes on Thursday before I did the report on Sunday. The and same so, reporters that ended up uh, being fired by, uh, in essence, by CBS later. It's too bad. It's not good to be good at your job in, in network television. That's my You theory. also wrote in your book, there was a widespread understanding that those who died in interrogation were not to be buried, lest the bodies be disinterred later, but had to be destroyed by acid and other means. That's what I wrote. I mean, what am I supposed to say? Yes, it was understood. This is early in the war. There was—excuse uh, me, do you think it stopped? Do you know how many warfare places we're in right now? Seventy-six. The United States is conducting war in 76 countries now. If you don't think assassinations are going on, just as, all, just as much, you they are. You also wrote about the use of fire ants. Um, 
Ter I didn't write. It was a story we didn't publish because it just, it just, um, it was one of the fights I had with the editors. I mean, he may have been right. But the assassinations the, the, you're talking about in our last 15 seconds, and then we're going to do part two. Well, I mean, when you when you have the special operations forces operating all over Africa, if you think they're telling the truth about what happened anywhere in Mali or else place, it may be 70 different. We're all over Africa. Nobody controls what they're doing. Um, it's a big problem, and this president, of course, doesn't know and doesn't care. But you know, but there are people there. There are people behind him who do care. But it's going to be a long process. We're talking to Seymour Hirsch, and we're going to continue with a web exclusive at democracynow.org. The Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist who's written for The New York Times, The New Yorker, um, exposed the My Lai massacre. His memoir is just out. It's simply called Reporter. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Norman Shake, Carla Wills, Laura Gattesdiener, Sam Alcoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Trina Nadura, Nat Needham, Libby Rainey, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Naguera, Paul Huckabee, our engineers. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.